Hello everyone, it's August and we've got a few things to cover in this video, specifically the giveaway winners as well as the Q&A, but first let's quickly take a look at everything that was picked up in July 2023, starting off with a few pieces sent in. Kicking things off is this great set of Russian Tiger Stripe, also known as Shadow, Tiger, and most notably Kamush. This pattern was popular with the Ministry of Internal Affairs, as well as certain units of the National Guard, among others. Being around for a while, there's quite a few variations of this variant, but others as well, most notably a bluer one often seen by law enforcement units. Thank you very much, Nick, for sending this uniform in. Next up is this great grouping out of Brazil showcasing the Army's lizard pattern, which is in the running for one of the longest camouflages in continual use as it was first introduced in the late 1980s. Most of Brazil's military branches continue to use variations of this pattern, with more regional units using others. This particular uniform, though, was worn by a member of the Army Dental Service, which is something you don't often come across, making it that much more unique. Thank you, Rodrigo, for sending everything in, as well as sharing information surrounding it and others. Next up are two more patterns, one out of Albania and the other out of the Philippines. On the left is Albania's current woodland pattern, often referred to as a digital flectarm because of the colors and shapes being seemingly based off of Germany's. Having a bit of a worn and faded set for a while, finding a brand new unissued one was pretty nice. On the right is a great set of PNP, or Philippine National Police Blue DPM, with patches still attached. Being used since the 1990s, the pattern is a pretty unique one due to its darker colors that seemingly blend the blue means police motif often seen, but also giving it a level of urban concealment. Finally, to wrap things up are these two helmets, both from around the era of World War II. The smaller is a Swedish M21, sometimes referred to as M18. There were two versions of this helmet, with one seeing a wider brim and slightly different crest on the front. They sort of have a discussion around the nomenclature to some extent based on the dates, but what is known is that this particular one was refurbished for army use in 1942 or so due to the side decal. The larger helmet is certainly an odd one, but has a practical use. It's a US Navy talker helmet. The reason they are so big and have such odd padding is due to them being worn over headsets, thus the name talker. This particular one is missing the chin strap, but is still in overall great condition and one of the oddest now in the collection. Okay, but with that, we've covered all the pickups for the month, so let's now switch over to the giveaway winners and Q&A. When picking winners, duplicate entries were removed, seeing the three chosen at random, with the prizes being given out the same way they were announced, in the giveaway video, meaning we'll be starting with the unissued set of Vietnamese K-94 bamboo, then the Malaysian firefighter, and finally the East German helmet. Emails will be sent to the winners a few minutes after this video goes live, so be sure to check your inbox. Winners will have until the end of August to reply, and if for whatever reason they don't, another drawing will happen for the prize. So we'll start with the Vietnamese K-94 set, then answer a few questions, announce the Malaysian camo winner, a few more questions, then conclude with the winner of the East German helmet. Okay, so our first winner is Tyler Cavanaugh. Congrats, be sure to shoot us a reply. All right, let's get into some questions. A few people asked about camouflage preferences, so let's cover those and some others. Favorite current issue pattern? Probably Ukraine's MM14, or rather the family of patterns around it, which sounds like a lame answer, but after doing the video on their endeavor to adopt a new pattern, it just sort of latched on. Between the numerous versions like the Border Guard, Standard, National Guard, Naval, and prototypes, there's just something about it that's simple, yet really appealing. Favorite less common or obscure pattern? That's sort of a tough one. I don't think there's one in particular, but rather a sort of category. Copies, clones, or the melding of patterns. For instance, Bulgaria's current Air Force design, which is just a US UCP derivative. It's almost identical, but is used in a more specific and effective way. Another would be one of Nigeria's naval designs, which looks to have taken China's 07 naval and Air Force shapes and colors and blended them together into another camo. It's super strange, but also really unique and very flashy. Let's throw in a few quick answers too to cover all the bases. Favorite screen use pattern, probably the Children of Men Digital Urban DPM. Favorite commercial pattern, the Red Dawn copy pattern, which is different from the actual Red Dawn pattern and was sold sometime after the movie's release. And yes, the video is being worked on, so don't worry. Favorite overall pattern, East German Streetarn, and in a way, a lot of the Warsaw Rain designs. Again, maybe a basic answer, but the simplicity of it and the variations you can find, coupled with the overall look and accessories you can put together. It makes no damn sense. It compels me though. And finally, a pattern that would be picked to wear in the apocalypse. That's a tough one, but you'd also have to consider uniform cuts, and perhaps the best one would be the Swiss M6170 with the Liebermuster. No need to fiddle around with too much extra gear and whatnot with all those pockets. Okay, another question? What was the first surplus piece purchased? Well, collecting now for about 20 years or so, it's a bit hard to remember that far back, but I believe it was either a British Woodland DPM smock or pair of Flectarn pants. Starting out in collecting is always fun and can be exciting, but also a bit challenging, as if you're going in cold, there's a lot to learn and figure out whether it be what you want to focus the collecting 
something on, what's real and what's not, and perhaps most importantly, is it well-priced? That's part of the reason the channel was started, to try and help to some extent with all that. Thankfully, nowadays, there are tons of resources and outlets to ask questions, buy, sell, and trade, and make connections in general. And while on that sort of train of discussion, another question was how do you store pieces? It's a great question, and there's a lot of answers depending on who you ask. It seems that most people starting off will use a closet, which is definitely a good option, but most will reach the point where it's just not enough space, and that was certainly the case. Personally, to overcome this for a time, hanging space bags were used, the ones where you suck all the air out. However, some argue that this may cause wrinkles and marks, which could definitely be the case. Eventually, more closets were used, and then, due to unrelated things, a storage unit was rented out that had enough extra space for two rolling racks of clothing. Now, hanging up garments is one of the two most common methods, but the second is through either zippered bags or bins. That's how the collection is stored currently. Each individual uniform is safely folded and placed inside a Ziploc bag with the air mostly pressed out. It essentially seals the piece and helps protect it from the elements. This will definitely allow you a ton more space, however the downside is the collection is not visible, and if a certain uniform or piece is needed, you gotta go dig to find it. But here's the current setup for a bulk of the uniforms and accessories. After trying out a number of bins, the HDX Home Depot ones seem to be the best, as they're designed to be stackable, they come in various sizes, you can secure the lids with zip ties or rope, and the larger ones have wheels so you can roll them around. The designs have been copied by a few other companies, so you can find very similar ones pretty easily. But now looks like a good time to announce the winner of the Malaysian Fire Uniform. Congratulations to Rubicon762. Be sure to check your email and message back. Okay, now while still on the topic of hardware, another question was where do you get all the pieces to display the uniforms, i.e. the mannequin heads, and so on? Well, here's a quick look at some displays. Most of what you see was actually acquired from companies going out of business. The glass display cases were mostly picked up from a Kmart that was closing down, the pallet racking came from a Target overflow warehouse, as well as a Toys R Us backroom, and the mannequins were grabbed from all of the above, plus a Sears and JCPenney. Aside from being a fun little side hobby of visiting and filming closing businesses that have fallen victim to the retail apocalypse, these are fantastic places to source all sorts of fixtures and displays. Often places will begin to liquidate their inventory and soon after price fixtures and hardware. You can certainly jump on it early, but the closer it gets to the final day, the better haggling you can do. By the last week, most places will just want it all gone and are willing to go pretty low. These liquidation sale periods will vary from a few weeks to a few months, with some just doing an online auction for lots of items in person or online. It really all depends on the company. As for the mannequin heads specifically, those were bought off eBay. Another question asked was how are pieces acquired and are they expensive? Pieces are picked up through numerous methods. By and large, the internet is the primary source, mainly eBay. Saving sellers and searches is a great way to be alerted about certain pieces if you're after anything specific. Additionally, just finding a few websites or companies that deal in surplus or militaria and following them helps you keep up on new items. Following them on social media, assuming they have an account and are active, is also a good way to stay informed. On top of that, like most professions, hobbies, and interests, collecting can also be just about who you know. Simply buying or trading is a great way to create a new contact. Whether it's in person at a show or store or online, taking the extra few steps to talk with them and what you're interested in can lead to who knows what, so be sure to network. As for cost, yes, it can be pricey, but if you know what you're after, just check outlets. A helmet on eBay could go for $100, but on some random website could be 30 or vice versa. Just always be sure to vet the site and use a secure way to pay. But this is a good transition into another question asked regarding why certain things seem to arrive or become available in waves. Now, not really dealing in bulk, but seeing a lot of things through research, buying, and just watching trends, it seems to come down to a few factors. Government policy, or decisions, middlemen, and newer equipment. Certain countries like the United States will just auction off a lot of their older surplus and used equipment that's obviously not sensitive or dangerous. You can register at sites and bid on them. This is a year-round thing with all sorts of items popping up throughout the country. However, other countries will hold on to items well after they have been retired or replaced, with some even sending or selling inventory to other countries. A good example of this was Romania sending thousands of its M73 helmets to Afghanistan to equip its army around 15 or so years ago. Even still, other countries will just straight up destroy or recycle pieces like Canada, which a few years ago had a video on YouTube showcasing how old CAD Pat uniforms are shredded seeing the fabric recycled. It really all comes down to policy and raising money, but that's where middlemen like wholesalers come in too. It seems that many governments will sell to larger established companies like Sturm, for example, which is based out of Germany and the US. In turn, a lot of companies and websites will buy in bulk from these wholesalers and then sell to consumers. 
You can buy from Sturm directly to a small capacity, but if you want the good stuff, you need to be a registered company. If you watch a lot of smaller surplus sellers' websites, they'll often get the same items around the same time, which likely means they're all sourced from the same wholesaler. Additionally, other older resellers or companies may have a while back bought up a huge assortment of pieces and just sat on them selling small quantities here and there through more conventional means, like in-store, or through eBay. Working at a surplus store in New York City for about two years, I saw tons of obscure and old things just bundled up in boxes. Perhaps the best example was unissued Union cartridge boxes from the US Civil War that had been sitting probably for 50 plus years, and whether they'll sell or stay there is entirely up to the owner. All it takes is one person or group to come along and make that connection with them, and next thing you know, something that was common years ago but is now rare is back on the market in mass. A great company to watch, which sort of gives a little peek behind the curtain, is Americana Pipe Dream Apparel which has exploded in popularity because of their online presence on TikTok and Instagram, not to mention a lot of interesting military ed offers. They talk quite a bit about their dealings with surplus sellers and wholesalers on an episode of the Art of War podcast, which was fascinating to listen to. So if you want to learn a little bit more, definitely check it out. Then obviously the third factor is new equipment and uniforms. As they're phased in, older uniforms are phased out with troops sometimes keeping and selling them, while unissued stock sticks around for smaller scale or specialty use, or just lays around until the nation decides to to liquidate them. I think there's time for two more quick questions that are related to the channel and YouTube. When did you think the project gained real traction? Assuming that's referring to the channel in general, the two points that really caused a huge jump and a surprise was the German Flecktarn video and the Marriott Carpet Camouflage video. The Flecktarn video was really early on, and seeing the subscriber count explode for the few days after came at such a shock. The Marriott carpet camo, though not seeing an immediate jump, slowly, then suddenly grew to be one, if not the most popular video, likely because of the obscure and absurd story behind it, which is definitely understandable. Finally, what is your background and how did you get into surplus collecting? This was actually touched on in the very first video uploaded where the whole concept of the channel was outlined, but that was over five years ago now. To answer, my background is in video production, went to school for it, and do small projects and videos here and there in both a professional and personal capacity. After a few years of collecting and seeing a large amount of videos out there of gear that was just very point and shoot, the idea of marrying the hobby of collecting with the skills of writing, filming, and editing just seemed natural. As for collecting, I got into it when I was given some old USBDUs by a family member who had been in the US Air Force when I was in fifth or sixth grade. And after that, the interest just exploded or spiraled, depends on who you ask. But all right, here seems like a good point to announce the third and final winner who will be receiving the East German helmet. Congrats to Andrew Bailey. Again, be sure to check your email and reply. As mentioned earlier, the three winners will be notified by email shortly after the video is posted, so keep an eye out. Thank you everyone who has asked questions and submitted entries into the contest, as well as everyone who's watched, subscribed, and just supported the channel up until this point, and even those after. As for the requests to cover topics people have left in practically every video's comment section, just know that they are noted and will likely be covered at some point down the line. As said in a previous video not too long ago, certain topics come together very easily, while others can take forever to produce. It really all comes down to the resources and information out there, as some topics just require connecting the dots, while others require scouring and searching with info known only to very few. So if you have any details about something you would like to see, feel free to reach out. Thanks to everyone who watched and has watched over the last five plus years, and keep an eye out as there's quite a few interesting and requested videos being worked on. Take care, everybody.